Now, I will remind you once again of the triangle. We are trying to use an interdisciplinary approach by connecting different fields and use it to make our environment and our buildings better. That is why I divided the research in three areas. One concerning the programming in the CAD and the BIM world, one concerning virtual reality and, of course, artificial intelligence. I only talked about artificial intelligence in abstract terms, and today we're going to start discussing some concrete algorithms and applications. So what would be the goal of this? Well, the goal is to have an expert AI architect advisor that may help us design aesthetically pleasing, functionally perfect and statically efficient buildings and environments. And who knows, it might turn out that these algorithms can design better buildings than we can, because again, it might turn out that design is not such a complicated process, but it is up to us to discover that, maybe sooner than we think. So when we talk about AI, in the majority of cases, we will talk about machine learning algorithms. If you're confused about the terminology and hear both of these interchangeably, uh, machine learning is kind of a subset of AI. A AI is a field that exists longer and it can be divided into many parts of which machine learning can be seen as one. For example, natural language processing is another one. Now, there are different groups of algorithms involved in the machine learning. The main distinction was uh, between supervised learning and uh, unsupervised learning. And recently, a third category called reinforcement learning reserved to be seen as a separate set of algorithms. Now, this is not the subject of this video, but I will explain it very shortly. Supervised learning algorithms work with a set of data, like those algorithms that you train to do something, maybe recognize a handwriting. You have a large set of input data and you know exactly what you want to have as an output. You have seen those, for sure. In an unsupervised learning, you have input data, but you do not have output variables. You do not have the clear goal. So these algorithms try to find out the connections between the input data, clusters, differences. Imagine giving the algorithm 1000 photographs and tell it to group them into some clusters without telling it how or why, without prior knowledge. And then you have reinforcement learning. It's the one that was used to create AlphaGo to beat the world champion in the game of Go. And many think it is one of our best shots at general artificial intelligence. And reinforcement learning is similar to the unsupervised, but these algorithms do not try to find differences and similarities in the input data. They want to find a behavior that gets them to some kind of reward maximization. Now, all these categories can be helpful in the creating of an AI designer software, but in this video, we will find ourselves more in the reinforcement learning probability in statistic waters. We will talk about the so-called multi-arm bandit problem that is just a very, very small piece of the puzzle on the way to learning how to create a useful AI algorithm. So again, let's say this is the big picture. Our goal is a complete picture with all parts of, the, of it ahead of us and many of them unknown and in the fog. And we are making a first step by turning over one piece of the puzzle called multi-arm bandit. So what is this problem? Have you ever seen one of these slot machines? Of course you have. They're also known as one-arm bandits. So a multi-arm bandit is a mathematical problem that imagines a person being in front of many of these machines. And that person has a limited number of times they can play. Let's say they have a thousand attempts to pull the arm. And every time they can choose a different machine if they want to. So this person has to decide which ones to pull in order to get the highest reward. Now this is relatively tricky. Why? Well, first, every machine is different and it will have a different distribution of rewards. It's not such a trivial problem. So for this purpose, I programmed a small multi-arm bandit problem solver. And in order to demonstrate the effect of it to you, I wanted to come up with a hypothetical example from the building industry. So I thought, what if I presented the problem to our uh, AR architect like this? And I think we should give it a name, right? Since most of my plugins are called Eve, let's call this one Adam. Uh, so Adam, please. I would like you to learn to design a roof of a house. Or let's say I want you to advise me on what kind of a roof should I choose for my design. And I hope you will get better in time and that your advice will make more and more sense. So here's how I will teach Adam to learn that. So now a disclaimer again, using just this algorithm on its own doesn't make so much sense for this. And we will not use it on its own in the future. Remember, this is just a small piece of the puzzle. Adam will be able to advise me on the roof design only when he's whole, representing the whole puzzle together using all different kinds of ideas to come up with an efficient and beautiful solution. Using only the multi-arm bandit solver to learn is very simplistic and naive, but I'm using it to explain to you how the solution for this problem works. That being said, I will let Adam generate many different roof solutions. So imagine that each solution is one slot machine, but what is the reward? So how would you as a human choose a roof design? I guess you would think about the climate and you would think about the materials, which ones are available, 
not too expensive, the properties of materials fit to the function of the building and the climate, how, how much manual work and how much automated work is needed. This is also connected to the price of the workers in this particular city or town. What is the chance of a superhero destroying your roof with, uh, while chasing villains in his flying car? That sort of thing. But the catch is that you have to rely on intuition or do a hell of a lot of research. Now imagine we had an algorithm that did that for us, all that research. That will be a different part of the puzzle. And we're not there yet. So instead, we can imagine using human help. So for our hypothetical case, we imagine Adam to be a universal assistant that all architects can access on a website or something like that. And architects can ask him for an advice. And we will imagine that in one experiment, Adam will come up with n number of different combinations of roof types. So every time a certain number of architects from uh, anywhere in the world asks him for an advice on a roof type, that will be one pool of the slot machine. Adam will choose one solution and advise it to all of them who asked him. And those architects will give their reward. Some will say, no way, this doesn't fit at all to what I need. Let's say the reward is minus three. Some will say, this fits perfectly, let's say that's plus three. Some will be moderately satisfied with the advice, zero, and so on. And that will be our distribution of rewards for the specific roof type. And as Adam keeps giving advice, he will start to realize that all of his solution will have different distributions. Now, I programmed a small learning plugin that learns by pulling those arms of our metaphorical slot machines in time. And it gets better at it. Now, this is really cool. Check this out. If we say that this is our reward and it goes from minus three to three, and let's say, uh, imagine Adam only came up with 10 roof solutions. Now let him pull the arm 1000 times. That means let him suggest a different solution to a group of architects in the world 1000 times. So this is what happens after 1000 pulls. Nothing special, right? It didn't seem like Adam learned something after giving 1,000 advices. How about we do it again? Nope, nothing special. Well, let us train Adam a bit. Let him give uh, 1,000 advices for 2,000 runs. But, and here's the main twist, we will not let him train on the same distribution. For every run, we will switch the group of architects and they will give him a whole new distribution of rewards. So the question is uh, that if Adam gets a new reward distribution after every 1000 advices, will he be able to learn to be better and better at it? After 2000 runs, 2000 groups of different architects with different criteria, we can check what is the average reward that he is able to produce with his advice. And even better than that, I made a plugin so we can observe that in real time. So are you ready? Look at the graph. And Adam, start learning. Do you see what's happening? With every run, the graph is updating. As the runs progress, Adam is getting theoretical rewards from architects and he is learning slowly which solutions he should suggest so that he gets the most reward. And the amazing thing is that even if the distribution of rewards changes completely for every run, he still manages to give better and better advice. I will pause for five seconds for you to take that in and repeat it again, slowly. Every change in this graph means a new group of architects giving different rewards. But still, somehow, Adam learned how to choose the roof solution so that he gets the highest reward. And he did that in less than a minute. Of course, in our case, I faked the architect's rewards by giving a random distribution to every solution for every run. But the point of this example is to show you that an algorithm can learn in time what to do to achieve highest reward. And that is what design is, right? Suggesting solutions that can achieve the highest reward if we interpret reward as functionality, stability, or even beauty. And we can already imagine how to expand this. The algorithm would choose its solution based on the location and climate in order not to give the same advice to the architect in Melbourne and to the architect in Norway. Also, an algorithm should work without human evaluation as well, because we do not have all these evaluators and if we did, then neural networks would probably be more appropriate. And we will explore all that in the future. But I will remind you again that in practice, you do not know what the value distribution is. No one will tell you that. You have to find out on your own. That's why this is a learning algorithm. And that is what makes it amazing. And you have to strike a nice balance between so-called exploitation of high reward solutions and exploration to get the highest average reward. And even if the rewards change in time, the algorithm adapts. You can imagine this also as a change of style. If architects uh, start using a different style or different materials that won't prevent Adam to still good, uh, give good advice and adapt. Keep in mind that you have to take this example with a grain of salt. 
This is not imagined for a literal immediate application. It's very hard to construct an example in, in which you use only the multi-armed bandit problem because the problem itself is not really suitable for architecture and design and it will be useful only as a small part of a more complex algorithm. But nevertheless, I wanted to come up with an example in architecture and not some abstract concept. And I hope I did that relatively successfully. If you start asking questions like, but how can we teach an algorithm what is beautiful when we cannot define it ourselves? Then you're rushing and you're way, way ahead. Be patient, hold your judgment and doubts and open your mind. This is just the first step, a small, small piece of a puzzle. And our goal is to the whole picture and a lot of it is still in the fog, as I said. You can, you can consider this just as a small cog in a machine that we are going to build together. Okay, this video is already way too long. I, I hope you find it interesting and fun and I would really like to hear from you some ideas for implementations in architecture for this simple algorithm or how this algorithm could be combined with something else. I also want to remind you of my video on peer-reviewed publications. Something like this that I presented here would be a classical research paper, but I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to write a research paper and then send it to conferences and journals. I do not have a position at the university nor am I a part of any research project. I do this on my own and in my spare time. And I share my ideas for free. Anyone, a peer or non-peer, can review them, judge them or state their opinion. And all those that uh, do have positions at universities and dozens and hundreds of publications under their belt, I'm eager to hear what they have to say on the subject and how far they got in applying these types of algorithms in architecture. Support us on Patreon, visit our website, share, stay free and get to work.